several weeks, we have been concentrating on who we are. We talked about how we need to be gospel-focused in our worship, in our community, in our mission or service, and in our multiplication. But what good does it do talking about who we are if we don't carry it out in our action? You know, I can sit here and tell you all day who I am but I need to prove it to you. You know, it's, it's, that, it's that fact that we can talk a really good talk, we can lay out a really good plan, but if we don't carry it out, what good is it done? Today being Valentine's Day, I could have preached a message on relationships, and it would have been fitting for this day. I could have preached a message on how to love your spouse and what it means to be in love with your spouse, and it would have been fitting. But today I do want to preach a message on hearts. I want to preach to, I want us to think about hearts. And this message is in line with what comes next. We talk about being gospel focused, and we need to be gospel focused, and we talked about what that looks like, but what's next? Where do we go? And what do we do with our gospel-focused mindset? 
Well, how do we carry those actions out? The first place we go needs to be to our knees. It needs to be on our knees. So today's message is simply called Broken Hearts and Bent Knees. Now, I know some of you may be thinking, well, it's Valentine's Day, preacher. Don't talk about broken hearts. Until we have a broken heart, we can't have a full heart. We have to have a broken heart for the lost. We have to have a broken heart for the fact of why we were left here. What is your heart condition is the question this morning that we all need to ask ourselves. What is our heart condition? Now, I've got a heart condition. It's called AFib. It's not fun. David understands what a heart condition is like, don't you, brother? But we're not talking about a physical heart condition. We're talking about a spiritual heart condition. We're talking about a heart condition that has a broken heart for those who need Jesus as their Savior. That's what comes next. When we become gospel-focused in all that we do, when we become gospel-centered in our life as a church and in our personal walk with Christ, what comes next is we have a broken heart for the lost. So this morning, I want you to go on a journey with me as we look at broken hearts and bent knees. Let's pray together. Father, as we come into your presence again, Lord, I just thank you for the gospel of Jesus Christ. Father, thank you for a church that lifts up the gospel of Jesus Christ. I thank you for a church that desires to live out the gospel of Jesus Christ. Father, this morning as we hear from you through your word, the message is very clear. We're to have a broken heart for those who need Jesus as their Lord and Savior. Father, may it be so today. Break our hearts for what breaks yours. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Do you have a heart like Jesus? When it comes to those that you know, when it comes to those that you love and their eternal destination, do you have a heart like Jesus? I want you to think about that. Jesus before he gave up his spirit, hanging on that cruel cross on Calvary. Jesus had been tortured. He had been beaten. He had been mocked. He had been uh, just went through things that no man should have gone through. But just before he hung his head and died, he said these words, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Jesus, hanging on the cross of Calvary, had a heart for those who were lost. God began to answer Jesus' prayer right there on Calvary. Father, forgive them because they don't know what they're doing. Jesus prayed that prayer, and just some 40-some-odd days later, we see Pentecost where the Holy Spirit comes down. The disciples are waiting in that upper room. Jesus prayed, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. Peter steps out on the porch and begins to preach at Pentecost. 3,000 souls came to Christ on that day because Jesus had a heart for the lost. He gave his life for the lost. In response to Jesus' intercession, for those who were transgressing against him, God snatched many souls from the pits of hell. And I pray this morning that yours is one of those souls that God snatched from the pits of hell. Jesus had a heart for the lost. In Isaiah chapter 53, verse 12, the prophet writes this, speaking God's word, therefore I will divide him a portion with many. This is speaking of Christ. And he shall divide the spoil with the strong because he poured out his soul to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he bore the sins of many and makes intercession for the transgressor. Jesus is continuing to pray for the lost, continuing to go before the Father for the lost. Do we have a heart to pray for the lost like Jesus? It starts when our hearts are broken for the lost. And we fall to our knees. 
I want you to think about this. Many of the great preachers of old display their heart for the lost. Some of these you may have never heard of. The only reason I heard of them is because in school we had to study some of these. But it resonated and it stuck. John Knox was an evangelist in Scotland. And his prayer was simple. One of the shortest prayers, but one of the most powerful statements I've ever heard. He said, Lord, give me Scotland or I die. He had a heart for his kinspeople. He had a heart for God to save those souls in Scotland. What about George Whitfield? He may be a more common name, one that you may have heard of. He said, oh, Lord, give me souls or take my soul. That's how serious George Whitfield was about praying for the lost. God, allow me to win someone to Christ or just take me on out of here. He knew what he was called to do. God used each of these faithful men to bring many souls to himself. He used these faithful men to share the gospel. Each of them understood what's at stake by not sharing the gospel. We're talking about being gospel-focused over the last several weeks. It matters, and it's a life or death matter, but it's not a life or death matter as far as the breath that we're breathing here on this earth. It's an eternal life and death matter. It's the difference between heaven and hell. They understood Do we realize that our family members, our coworkers, our neighbors will spend forever suffering in torment if they don't come to a saving knowledge of Christ? Does our heart break for them? Seventh century English Puritan Richard Baxter wrote these words, and I want you to listen to these very carefully. Oh, if you have the hearts of Christians... Or of men in you, let them yearn toward your poor, ignorant, ungodly neighbor. Alas, there is but a step betwixt them and death and hell. Many hundred diseases are waiting, ready to seize them. And if they die unregenerate, they are lost forever. Have you a heart of rock which cannot pity men in such such cases as this? If you believe not the word of God and the danger and if you believe not the word of God and the danger of sinners, why are you a Christian yourself? If you do believe it, why do you not bestir yourself to helping others? He says, if you are a Christian, if you believe in the gospel of Jesus Christ, why aren't you sharing? Why don't you have a heart to share with your lost neighbor? The Bible has examples of radical evangelistic prayer. One of my favorite examples is the example of Stephen. The apostles, you have to understand where they were. They were preaching and they were serving and they said, we need some help. We need some help because we can't devote ourselves to the prayers and to Scripture. We need some help serving the widows and serving the community. So he said, go out and call seven guys, the first deacons. They were called to serve the people. One of those first deacons was Stephen. And one of the first acts you see of a deacon is not, he wasn't serving tables and he wasn't delivering food boxes. He was on the street preaching. And let me tell you, buddy, If you go back and read the the sermon that Stephen was preaching, he was preaching from Genesis all the way up to what they had then. He was laying it out there. Well, naturally, they didn't like it. And so they decided to stone Stephen. They're stoning Stephen to death. And in Acts chapter 7, verses 59 and 60, Acts 7, 59 and 60, you read Stephen's prayer. Now, understand where he's praying. He is on the ground being pelted by rocks to the point of death. And he says this, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And falling to his knees, he cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. 
And when he said this, he fell asleep. Stephen being killed by men said, Lord, don't hold it against them. Allow them the opportunity to have what I've received, and that's Jesus Christ. That's what Stephen's prayer. And one of the people who was standing right there as Stephen was being stoned was Saul of Tarsus. And he was also one of the answers to Stephen's prayer because Saul became Paul, and you know the story. But Paul, once he came to a saving knowledge of Christ, displayed his prayer life. So the first question was, do you have a heart like Jesus, but do you have a heart like Paul when it comes to those that you know and love and their eternal destination? Paul gives us a beautiful example in Romans chapter 9. Romans chapter 9, the first three verses of that chapter. Paul is writing this church in Rome, and he says these words, and I'm speaking the truth in Christ. I'm not lying. My conscience bears me witness in the Holy Spirit. That if I have that, that I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart, for I could wish that I myself was accursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my brothers, my kinsmen according to the flesh. Wow. You talk about a heart for the lost. Paul says, listen, God, if you can take my salvation and give it to somebody else, do it. That's how serious Paul was about the lost. He had a broken heart, and he was on bended knee. And he says, listen, I wish that I was a curse, anathema. I wish I was damned to hell so that someone else could have salvation. Do we have a heart like Paul when it comes to our lost friends and family members? But let's go all the way back toward the beginning of the gospel narrative. Let's go all the way back to Moses. Do we have a heart like Moses when it comes to those that we know and love and their eternal destination? All the way back in Exodus chapter 32, you know what's going on? They're wandering through the wilderness and they're on that 40-year journey. Moses goes up to receive the law of the Lord, the Ten Commandments, and he comes back down and they had already built a golden calf because they thought that's what God looked like and they were worshiping and God's angry and he's ready to just take it. I'm, I'm done with them. Listen to Moses' prayer in Exodus 32, verses 31 and 32. So Moses returned to the Lord and said, Alas, this people have sinned a great sin. They have made for themselves gods of gold. But now, if you will forgive their sins, Moses is saying, please, God, forgive them. But then notice what he says. But if not, please blot me out of your book that you've written. Moses said, God, I want them to have salvation. And if they can't have it, just go ahead and take me out too. Moses was serious about prayer but about prayer for the lost. Do you have a heart like Jesus? Do you have a heart like Paul? Do you have a heart like Moses? What's our motivation? We have to have some kind of motivation. What's our motivation to have broken hearts and bent knees for the lost? I think our motivation is found in Romans chapter 10, verse 1. Paul writes this, Brothers, my heart's desire and prayer for them is that they may be saved. He says, my heart's desire, my prayer for all of my kinsmen, my family members, my, my, my nation, is that they be saved. Is that our prayer? Is that our heart? Is that our motivation? You know, God honored the prayer of these righteous men, and he'll honor our prayers as well. When we have broken hearts and bent knees, it doesn't matter if they're our friend or if they're our foe. It doesn't matter whether they're moral or immoral. It doesn't matter if we even know them or not. If we just meet somebody, we need to understand that we need to pray for the lost. To be gospel-focused, we need to spend time praying for the lost. 
one of my favorite pastors of old to read and to study and just to dive into his heart is C.H. Spurgeon. And he writes this, he who prays without fervency does not pray at all. Now think about what he's saying. He's speaking of prayer. He who prays without fervency, without that, without that ferocity, doesn't pray at all. We cannot commune with God who is a consuming fire if there is no fire in our prayers. Many prayers fail of their errand because they, there is no faith in them. Prayer, prayers which are filled with doubt are requests for refusal. Wow. He was serious about prayer. If they're filled with doubt, they're a request for a refusal. When we pray for the lost, when we pray for our loved ones to come to a saving knowledge of Christ, are we praying with doubt or are we praying a prayer of faith? God, I understand that they need Jesus as their Savior, and I'm praying right now, believing that you're going to call them to salvation. So I got to thinking about this, and there are some ways that we need to pray for the unsaved. We shouldn't just throw it out. I shouldn't just throw it out there and say, okay, you need to pray for the lost, but how do we pray for the lost? On Wednesday nights, we've been studying prayer. We've been going through some, some, some studies on how to prepare to pray, and we looked at the, Lord, at the model prayer which Jesus gave his disciples the disciples could have asked Jesus for anything. What, did he, what are they asking for? Lord, teach us how to pray. Because they knew if they, earnest, if they learned how to pray, that all the power in heaven would be at their disposal when they go before the throne of God. So when we think about praying, how do we pray for the unsaved? I just want to give you several ways that we need to pray for the unsaved. We're going to look into Scripture, and we're going to learn if we look into Scripture, we can pray God's Word back to Him because you know something that's awesome? God is always true to his word, amen? And God will always honor his word. So why not pray his word back to him? God, this is what you tell us, and we're asking this as our prayer. So let's just look at a few ways. How do we pray for the unsaved? First of all is we pray for them to be saved according to God's will. According to God's will. You know, we've learned about prayer that we need to pray in God's will. You know, God's will be done. A lot of times we pray selfishly, but we need to pray God's will be done. And you might think, well, you know, why would we do that in, in a prayer for the lost? I want to share it with you. 1 Timothy chapter 2, the first four verses. Paul is writing this young pastor, and he says, I want to spill some wisdom on you, Timothy, and I want you to pay close attention. Listen to this. He said, it's, it's about prayer. He says, first of all, I urge you, that supplication, prayers, intercession, and thanksgiving be made for all people, for kings and all who are in high position, that they may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. This is good, and it is pleasing in the sight of God our Savior. Paul's saying, listen, when you pray, Timothy, pray for the people who are in high positions. Folks, I got news for you. Whether you voted for him or not, whether you like him or not, pray for President Biden. Because he's the president. Some people say, he's not my president. Yes, he is. Do you live in the United States? We might not have chose him, but he is. And Paul is saying, pray for him. I got news for you. You have a hard time talking bad about somebody if you're praying for him. It's a whole lot easier to talk bad about him than just pray for him sometimes. But Paul is saying, pray for these. But then look at what he says in verse 4. He's talking about God, who desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. What that means is, Paul is telling Timothy, God's will, God's wants, God's desire is that all men be saved. So what is God's will? That men come to the knowledge of truth and that they are saved. God, you tell us in Scripture that you desire all men to be saved and Father, you know and fill in the blank needs Jesus as their Savior. God, it's your will. But then we see in 1 John chapter 5, I love this, John, the beloved disciple, one closest to Jesus, he writes this, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life. 
And this is the confidence that we have toward him that if we ask anything according to his will, and what did Paul say his will was? That all men be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. If we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have the request that we have asked of him. Father, your desire is that all men be saved. And I'm asking you right now, Father, please save and fill in the blank. Pray it in his will. Father, save them. They need Jesus. So we need, to pray for, for, we need to pray for them to be saved according to God's will. The second thing is this, is we need to pray for God to send laborers to the harvest. We need to pray that God will send laborers into the harvest. What would happen if I gave you a task and said, I'm just throwing a number out here. There's 25,000 people in our, in our immediate area. And Ricky, by yourself, I need you to go have a 30-minute conversation with every single person. How long would it take you? Wouldn't get it done. We couldn't get that done in a lifetime. So we need extra help. Ricky said, well, let me recruit somebody. Let me help somebody. And folks, when it comes to being gospel-focused, we need to have extra laborers in the field. And we need to pray for God to send those laborers. In Matthew chapter 9, verse 37 and 38, Jesus is speaking to his disciples. He says, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into the harvest. I want to take it up a notch. Our prayer would be easy if we said, God, there's a lot of people out there that need Jesus and I pray that you send somebody to talk to them. And we sit right there. Pray for God to send laborers into the field to harvest and say, God, I'll be one of them. I'll go share Jesus with somebody. You know, we're the delivery method that God chose for his gospel. Believers are the delivery method that God chose for his gospel to go out into all the world. And we need laborers in the field. Pray for them to be saved according to God's will. Pray for laborers to be sent into the harvest. But the next thing is we need to pray for a witness of love for the lost. We need to pray for a witness of love. You know, I grew up in an era, and a lot of you did too, where preachers would roll their Bible up and smack you in the head until you gave your heart to Jesus beat you down. What do they call it? Hell, fire, and brimstone. Remember those days? But we live in a different generation now where if you start yelling at somebody, what do they do? Shut you off. They don't want anything to do with you. They don't want to hear a word you say. But we need to pray for a witness of love for the lost. John chapter 13, verse 35, Jesus tells his disciples, you know, by this, all men will know that you're my disciples. You have love one for another. If you have love, they're going to know that you're following me. In Jude 22, it says, and of some having compassion, making the difference. We need to say, God, I need, I need a broken heart. I need an attitude of love for the lost. You've heard the saying all your life, I'm sure, hate the sin but love the sinner. But a lot of times, we'll bash them so bad about the sin that we don't show them that we love them. We need to, we need to share the truth in love. We need to pray for a witness of love for the lost. We also need to pray for God to use us in the harvest. There was a statistic given by Lifeway, and I almost don't want to share it because it's heartbreaking and it's really, really sad when you think about it. That 90% of professing Southern Baptist Christians have never shared their faith with another person. 90%. Of the 
Of the remaining 10%, they did a study on how many pastors personally shared their faith with someone else. And that was even more staggering. I'm not talking about standing up here preaching a gospel message. I'm talking about one-on-one. Folks, we need to pray for God to use us in the harvest. The question that we need to ask ourselves is, do we want to be used? Do you have a heart for the lost, a broken heart, so that you could pray for them? Isaiah chapter 6 is one of my favorite chapters in the Old Testament because it's that moment when Isaiah got to go face to face with God. Starts off in that passage of Scripture in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord high and lifted up, seated on his throne. And then he goes through the description of what he was seeing in the throne room of God. And he says, Lord, you know, woe is me for I... I'm undone, meaning I'm disintegrated before you. I'm a man of unclean lips, from a people of unclean lips. And the angel goes with tongs from the altar and touches his mouth with the coals to cleanse him. And you get down to verse 8. I love this. Because it tells us about the Trinity, but it also tells us about the heart of Isaiah. It says, I heard the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send? And here comes the Trinity. And who will go for us? Isaiah then said, here am I, send me. Now, there's something very important about that way he said it. Isaiah wasn't giving God a geographical location. I'm right here. He was giving him a willing heart. Here am I. Lord, I'm willing. Send me. I'll go. I'll go share your story with the people. Are we willing? Jesus is giving a parable of the wedding feast in Matthew chapter 22. And all these people were invited to come and They all gave excuses on why they couldn't be there. And Jesus just simply looked at the servants and they said, go therefore to the main roads and invite to the wedding feast as many as you can find. King James says, go out to the highways and the hedges and the byways. Go out and find whoever you can find. And the servant said, okay, we're going to go invite. And that It's what being gospel-focused is about. I'm going to go share the gospel. It doesn't matter what you look like. It doesn't matter where you live. It doesn't matter if I know you or not. I want to share the gospel of Jesus with you. We also need to pray for a witness of righteousness and fear of the Lord. We need to pray for a witness of righteousness and fear of the Lord. 1 Peter 2, verse 12 says, Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable, so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. Now, the reason I love that verse right there is the day of visitation means so that they'll see our conduct, they'll see our good deeds, and when the Holy Spirit shows up in their life to call them to salvation, they're going to say, okay, I see something different in them. We need to have that witness of righteousness. People need to see a difference in us. They need to see that we're living different, that we act different, and it's because we have Christ in our life. Wives can be a witness to a husband that's unsaved simply by their conduct. 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 1 and 2, it says, Likewise, wives, be subject to your own husband, so that even if some do not obey the word, They may be won without a word by the conduct of their wife when they see your respectful and pure conduct. Our witness will be seen. I shared with you Jude verse 22 earlier and of some having compassion, making the difference. But verse 23 says, save others by snatching them out of the fire uh, to others show mercy with fear hating even the garment stained by the flesh. We need to say, listen, I love you so much. 
that I cannot keep my mouth shut about what's to come if you don't place your faith in Christ. We need to pray for that witness of righteousness and fear of the Lord. But then the next one, here's a, here's a big one that a lot of times we may forget to pray. We need to pray for Satan to be bound that people might be free to receive the gospel. We need to pray for Satan to be bound because he is loose on this earth. And if there's one thing that Satan wants to do more than anything else to the church is to keep a muzzle on all the believers in Christ. He says, live life like you want to. Go to church, sing your little songs, but keep your mouth shut about Jesus. And he'll throw anything in our direction to keep our mouth shut about Jesus. 2 Corinthians chapter 4 Verses 3 and 4, Paul is giving us some valuable tools about Satan here. He says, even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. In their case, the God, or he's talking about Satan, the little g, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. Satan is blinding those who have not placed their faith in Christ. He's letting them see that this world has a whole lot to offer and keeping their minds occupied with the world so that they'll be blinded to the gospel of Jesus Christ. We need to pray before we ever share the gospel. God, I need you to bind Satan right now so that he will not be able to blind this person I'm about to talk to. Bind him. Satan is a strong adversary. We need to make sure that we ask God to handcuff him. The last thing this morning I want to share with you is this. Pray for the door to be open to share or to preach the gospel. Pray for that door to be open so that we can share and preach the gospel. Pray for an open door. 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 9, Paul says, For a wide door for effective work has opened to me, and there are many adversaries. Paul says, the door's wide open, but man, they're coming at me with everything they got. We need to pray for that door to be open wide. Paul also says in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 12, when I came to Troas to preach the gospel of Christ, even though a door was open for me in the Lord. Meaning, God opened that door wide. If we pray, God, open a door so that I can share the gospel you better be ready to share the gospel because he's going to open a door. The last verse I want to share with you this morning is turn to Revelation chapter 3. Revelation chapter 3, verses 7 and 8. And we'll close with this passage of Scripture. This is John revealing what Jesus has revealed to him about the churches. It says, And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, The words of the Holy One, the true one, who has the key of David, who opens and no one will shut, who shuts and no one will open. I know your works. Behold, I have set before you an open door which no one is able to shut. I know that you have but little power, and yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name. God has opened the door. Nobody can shut it. Are we ready to share the gospel? When you view someone that does not know Christ as their Lord and Savior, how do you view them? There's a couple more ways to pray that I haven't shared that I'll give you so you can feel it. Some of you are probably going, I can't leave if I don't fill in all the blanks, preacher. One is pray for there to be power in your witness. That's Acts chapter 1, verse 8. The other is pray for there to be a boldness to share the gospel. A boldness to share the gospel. I mean, I'm not afraid to Tell people what Jesus has done in my life. But what stops us from having a broken heart for the lost? 
Spurgeon, I shared with you earlier, had this to say, if hell must be filled, at least let it be filled in the teeth of our exertion and let no one go there unwarned and unprayed for. Let no one go there unwarned and unprayed for. I'll leave you with this illustration. I saw it many years ago, and you can go on YouTube, and you can watch it anytime you want. But the illusion act out in Las Vegas called Penn and Teller. Most of you have heard of Penn and Teller. Well, Penn Gillette is a very avid, well-known atheist. He writes about his non-belief, I guess is what you would call it. But at one of their shows, there was a guy there that was a Gideon. And he had a New Testament, and he presented that New Testament with Penn Gillette and this video, if you, if you Google Penn and Gideon New Testament, you can see the video. And he's talking about this, and he's talking about how nice that guy was, and he wasn't some kind of crazy guy, but he had written some notes in there. And Penn goes on to say, he said, you know, I'll never believe what he believes, but I just thought it was nice of him. And, but then he made a statement. He said, if I saw you standing in the street, and a bus was coming down the street, I'd do everything in my power to knock you out of the way of that bus. He said, if you believe like this guy believes, and you believe that there's a heaven and a hell, how bad do you have to hate somebody not to tell them about hell? Let that sink in for just a second. This is an atheist talking about a Christian. And he says, if you believe, how bad do you have to hate somebody not to tell them? And folks, that, those words have haunted me ever since I heard them. Do you have love for those who are lost without Christ? If you do, you need a broken heart. You need a bent knee.